So, uh, welcome once more to uh, the second of the mini series about standards versus uh, hackers and lawmakers. This is part two. Uh, it's worth mentioning uh, that this is um, a second part. The first part would be on the YouTube channel of uh, Isaac and Netherlands chapter. Uh, on behalf of uh, Isaac and Netherlands chapter, as well as Nuria, I would like to welcome you on another episode of uh, the Square Tables. Um, some house rules before we start. We're a bit late today due to a technical difficulty. Um, so I'm going to quickly go over the house rules. If possible, make sure that the, the account you logged in with MS Teams shows the, the, the same uh, first name and last name used for registration. This is for the CPE certification after the event. This presentation will be recorded and will be uh, most probably uh, along with the slides shared after the presentation. Uh, if possible, always keep your microphone on mute. Stop sharing your video camera completely because that affects, uh, let's say, the uh, performance of the meeting. And uh, whenever you have any questions, please either send them through text or use the raise hand feature. Uh, and we will be asking you to unmute and discuss uh, with the speaker. Today we have uh, three speakers. Um, two of them are uh, Slava uh, Raikva and Michael Petrov, and also Kumar uh, Seti. Um, I think without uh, further, uh, um, let's say, delays, I would uh, invite Kumar to start. Uh, Kumar, please go ahead and share your screen. Thank you very much. I'll just be sharing my screen right now. Can everybody see my screen? Not yet. It's taking a bit oh. of time. OK, let me try again. OK. How about now? Yes. Can you go in presentation mode? Yes, sure. Presentation mode, I think it's F5. Nope. I'm sorry, one second. There we go. How's that? Yep, excellent, okay. please start. Perfect, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kumar Seti. I'm the principal of Zacti Security Labs. Uh, we're based in Chicago, Illinois in the US. Thank you very much for having me. Today I'm going to be talking to you about threat modeling. We're just going to be walking through some uh, an approach, a simple but elegant approach to threat modeling. And I just want to walk through some of the different methodologies that are available for us. And this is something that isn't often done. So let me just begin. The problem, the attacks never end. As we saw, CNA recently paid $40 million in ransom uh, for an attack that occurred in March. We're seeing many organizations, small companies, medium-sized companies, who are falling prey to all kinds of attacks, uh, attacking power grids, lots of different things. And there are new attacks and new attack surfaces which are uncovered every day. Most organizations, from what I've seen, just go through checkbox exercises. They recycle risks. They fail to think outside the box. So I don't know if any of you have ever read Sun Tzu. He was a famous general in the 5th and 6th centuries in China. Uh, he said, if you know the enemy, and he wrote a very seminal work called The Art of War. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. So essentially he's saying you need to know yourself and know the enemy. I'm going to jump into an example from history, the Battle of Cannae, which was a very spectacular victory against a, the Roman Empire. So in 2016, a very pivotal battle, the Battle of Cannae, was fought between what was the Carthaginian Empire, the Roman Republic. And this battle was probably the closest the Roman state had ever come to its destruction in its history up to that point. 
But the Roman Republic survived this disaster and actually ended up annexing the Carthaginian Empire, which is present-day Tunisia. This battle was fought in southeast Italy between Carthaginian forces led by Hannibal, Barca, and Roman legions led by Lucius Paulus and Gaius Varro. After Rome won the First Punic War, they were pretty much the dominant naval power in the Mediterranean Sea. And Rome also colonized Iberia to mine its silver, further enriching the Roman Republic. So Hannibal understood Roman strategy, and he decided to take the initiative by taking the fight to the heart of the Roman Republic. He knew eventually that Rome would attack Carthage. So he had that foresight. So he thought, well, I'm going to take the battle to them. So he was thinking like a hacker. Hannibal started his campaign by invading Iberia. He procured silver, supplies, and food, and then he used these provisions and supplies to cross the, into the Alps, into Italy, with his army and war elephants. So after winning some decisive battles along the way, he marched through to southern Italy, where he used the Greek and Italian vassals of Rome to join his army. He then encamped at Cannae. He chose Cannae because it was the center of farming and grain production. It was kind of the breadbasket for the Roman heartland. And he specifically chose a region in Cannae, which was near the only source of water in the area. He knew Rome would attack. So this applied a lot of pressure on the Roman legions, and then he provoked the fight on his terms on their territory. And eventually what happened was, when the battle started, he outflanked the legions and crushed the Roman army. So, but unfortunately, Hannibal's army was small, and Carthaginian army is much smaller. Rome's legions were too big to lose. And uh, this initiated a long, drawn-out war where eventually the Roman general Scipio Africanus fought against Carthage, led a campaign against the Carthaginian Empire, and they, they annexed Carthage. So what are the lessons we can learn from history? History is filled with lessons. So what can we learn from this? Rome lost the Battle of Cannae because they underestimated and failed to understand their adversary. So I'll tell you, threat modeling is a very adversary-driven process. You have to think like your enemy. The Romans never imagined an army would cross the Alps from North Africa, very audacious move, with elephants. A lot of Romans had never even seen elephants, unique attacker tools. They did not anticipate what to defend. Where was he going to attack? He attacked Iberia, he went through the Alps, and then the southern Italy. He was unpredictable. And the Romans failed to anticipate where they would be attacked from the sole source of water in Cannae. So Hannibal Barca was a bold genius, and unlike any adversary the Romans had ever encountered. He understood his own capabilities and Rome's. He wisely utilized his assets. He found insiders to betray Rome, and he understood all their weaknesses. So he understood himself, and he understood his enemy. So he increased the chances of victory. He employed assets to gather intelligence, and he found the right attack surfaces, like any hacker, good hacker, would. So threat modeling is something probably the Roman Republic should have employed, but they didn't in this case. Rome failed to understand Hannibal, his motivations, his strengths, and where and when he would attack them. And they may have won the Battle of Cannae if they had established a threat model. I'm going to go to another uh, important lesson from history. Within the well within the 13th century, the Mongolian Empire, as, as we all know, was the largest land empire in the world. They ruled from Siberia and China and reached Budapest. Recently, I read a book, and it seems like the Mongols also invaded Palestine. I had no clue about that, but that was just very interesting. The Mongols tried dozens of times to invade India. They really wanted to uh, invade India. They never did. Every time they failed. In one instance, just when it seemed like the Mongols would win, they were crushed as a result of a unique counterattack. Uh, so one of the times they almost won was in 1299. The Mongol army led by Dua Khan marched 200,000 cavalry, thousands of foot soldiers, and siege weapons and projectile weapons using gunpowder. Very unique. All designed by Chinese engineers. That's one of the things the Mongols did. They, Whenever they conquered an area, they found the smart people, they found engineers, and they put them to work and they said we need a way to uh, bring down city walls and, and you're going to help us so they they thought gunpowder was a great idea so this army this huge army camped outside of delhi prepared to crush the city 
which is under the rule of the Delhi Sultanate controlled by Sultan Alauddin Khalji. So Sultan Alauddin Khalji was a very interesting person. He had a lot of foresight. He allowed his generals freedom to bring him ideas and he thought outside the box. That was a strength and that, that saved him and, and Delhi and India in return. And we'll go into that next slide. So the Mongol siege of Delhi, the siege went on for days. And at one point, it seemed that the Mongol army would breach the fortifications. And once they would do that, they would have annihilated everybody in all the residents of Delhi, like they did in many other places. So at the brink of defeat, some of the generals of the Sultan came up with a plan. Within the walls of Delhi, there was a huge store of fermented ale, like beer, which was being saved for a festival that was coming up. And also there were several thousand war elephants within the walls, within the city of Delhi. But during this time, an interesting thing was happening. It was elephant breeding season. So the male elephants were very irritable because their libido was very high. The army of the Sultan made the male elephants thirsty and hungry. And then what they did was they, somebody came up with a plan. They said, we've got to, we're, we're about to be overrun. We need to come up with a counterattack. So what they did was, on the other side of the battlefield, they put the female elephants and they fed them the ale to make them more docile. And what happens when you feed starving male elephants ale and beer? Makes them more aggressive. They're more willing to fight. Their inhibitions are lower. So in between the drunk female elephants and the drunk and libidinous male elephants were most of the Mongol army and their siege weapons. They were dug in. They weren't as flexible. So what the Sultan's generals did, they said, we'll release the male elephants. They're going to go straight for the females and nothing is going to stop them. So the drunk male elephants flanked and crushed and destroyed the Mongol siege weapons and the Mongol soldiers. So they crushed the invading army so they could reach the female elephants. This gave enough of a buffer and a time for the Sultan to lead his archers, cavalry and army, and he, he defeated the remaining Mongol army. So as a punishment, he took the remaining Mongol soldiers and their leaders, and he had the elephants crush them, and he sent he cut off their heads, and he sent thousands of heads back to Mongolia as a warning never to invade India again. But it didn't work. The Mongols were very, very stubborn. They tried for many years, even after this disaster, but they were still never able to conquer India. But eventually they actually did. The Mughal Empire, a piece of trivia, uh, they are remote descendants of... Uh, Mongolian, the Mongolian royalty, uh, Tamerlane. So they eventually did conquer India and ruled India for 300 years, but not in the way that they had imagined. So the Mongol invasion of India, what are the lessons we can learn here? The Mongol adversary model versus the Indian defender model. So as you know, with any hack, with any attack, it always comes down to model versus model and machine versus machine. The hacker machine versus the machine you're trying to protect. So the Mongol threat model, they had siege weapons, they had blueprints, they had a plan for, for destroying the city walls so they could come in and invade the, the city. But the Mongol threat model didn't take into account that within the Delhi walls there was a huge store of ale and elephants. They didn't put those two things together. They had no chance. And it was breeding season for the elephants. Their model did not take this into account. The Mongol army was dug in and concentrated on breaching the walls. They were inflexible at this critical point. So the generals of the Sultan in India used out-of-the-box thinking in developing a counterattack. The defender model enabled flexibility so the Sultan's men could formulate this attack. They had no choice. Their backs were against the wall. So this leads me into the next, this leads us into the next concept, the whole point of this. What is threat modeling? Threat modeling is a very adversary-driven process, that's key, through which security professionals identify threats and vulnerabilities, quantify the likelihood and impact, and then formulate techniques to mitigate attacks to protect an organization. This is very important. So you want to think like your enemy, come up with threats and vulnerabilities, pretend you want to attack your organization, quantify likelihood and impact as best as you can, and then formulate techniques to mitigate the attacks that you've come up with. It's a combination of art and science. Crystal ball isn't possible. And one very important thing is it should be systematic and structured. Why? Because if somebody else comes along 
you you turn over in your company, the ter- the security department turns over. Somebody's got to be able to pick up the threat model that you created and understand the rationale behind it. How do you how did you come up with the threats? How did you come up with the risks? And how did you come up with the countermeasures? And then they need to be able to continue that. This is a living document. This is a dynamic process. So the goal is forewarned is forearmed. You're trying to predict the future. So an important feature of this is that of all security professionals is you have to be able to predict the future. You have to understand the technologies and then understand that, hey, how do I how do I come up with a predictable model here? That's part of your threat model. So future threats, future attacks, future frauds and enablers. I put predict in quotes because it's impossible to predict the future with certainty. Most of us don't know what we're going to have for dinner tomorrow, but using the right tools and methodologies, we can at least ask the right questions in order to clarify our thoughts and obtain some measurements which we can use as inputs for our planning decisions. A completely siloed approach not work. And you need, you need a hybrid approach. You need to be able to, some people work very well alone. They want to be left alone and they want to write and they're very good writers and, and they want to collect their thoughts. You have to give people the opportunity to do that. But at the same time, then in order to validate all of those things and get the story straight, you put everybody together and you have working sessions. So what I've done in the past is we have a survey approach, then we have group sessions. And that clarifies everything much more. One suggested approach that's worked well for me in the past, it doesn't mean that this would work all the time, but this is just a starting point. You want to know yourself. So what are you trying to protect? That's the question you want to ask. Identify the system boundary, enumerate all your assets, and identify any intangible assets. So the outputs of this would be a data flow diagram, an asset list, surveys, completed surveys sent to individuals, and then notes from group sessions. Then the next step is you want to know your enemy and know your friends. Keep your enemies close, keep your friends closer. No, I'm sorry. Keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. That's what, that's what Michael Corleone said. So who are the attackers, internal and external? You want to understand the insider threats. Identify potential threat actors. Brainstorm motivations of an attacker. It's actually kind of a fun process to go through this. Identify any fraud risks. This is something that a lot of cybersecurity professionals ignore. You've got to understand the fraud motive. So you might have to talk to uh, different accounting departments, the AP department, the AR department. There's so many departments you can you can talk to, especially in accounting, financial operations. They'll tell you where their weaknesses are if you ask them. So who wants to steal and damage the assets? Who are you most concerned about? So then you come up with an adversary model, uh, attack scenarios, surveys again, and then notes from group sessions. So this is an individual and group session oriented thing. Now you begin to tie everything together. You say, know your enemy, know your friends, and know yourself. So what type of attack services are present? Where will the organization be attacked? Come up with methods and tools how you would attack. Identify third-party integrations, and you may even want to reach out to your third parties. Then in this way, you come up with a vulnerability model, uh, interface integration diagram. You want to see where everything comes together. Surveys sent to individual stakeholders. One thing I may not have mentioned here is you want to talk to the internal audit team and see if they if there are any issues. Read the financial report, the 10K. There's a lot of, there's a section on risks. In America, we issue a 10K, which is a quarterly or year annual report and a 10Q. And sometimes they put in risks in the 10Q, but it's, it's interesting. And then at the end, you want to tie it all together. You know it all. What are the risks, controls, likelihoods, and impact and the countermeasures? This is very important. You don't want to just come up with what could go wrong. You want to understand what do you need to do to fix those things? So you want to take a proactive approach. So the output of this would be a NIST matrix with risks, controls, likelihoods, calculated risk exposure, and detailed countermeasures. You want to be able to measure things. You want to take the attempt to measure things because if you can measure it, you can improve it. And then you can prioritize as well. Caveat. It's not as important to generate 
a lot of paperwork as it is to understand the organization's posture, threats, and countermeasures. A lot of people like to write reports and generate paperwork. That's fine. But really, the whole point is to gain a deeper understanding of how, where the weaknesses are and the solutions, potential solutions. So some threat modeling frameworks. These are the ones that I found. Um, there's a lot of good literature on them. There's uh, uh, NIST has a great threat modeling example. They actually walk through an entire example, and it's great. And it's updated very frequently, and there's a lot of input from the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, so it's, it's very good. Octave is more organizational-based, so enterprise-based. So I like it because it has a lot of good information where you can develop good surveys, and it, it looks at the entity, which is important. Pasta, Stride, Dread, and MITRE ATT&CK. Pasta, Stride, and Dread are more based on software development. Uh, some of these are were originated with Microsoft, and they've kind of taken on a life of their own, and, and they're good. But I think they're just a little bit narrow. Uh, MITRE ATT&CK I really like because it's kind of an open source threat modeling tool. Uh, and I'll just go into each one of these. As I said, the NIST threat modeling methodology uh, is very good. They have very good examples. Octave, uh, you can build asset-based threat profiles, identify, it helps you identify infrastructure vulnerabilities, and it's, it's strategic. And you can come up, I like it because it has a good source of questions for surveys, things like that, a good starting point. Pasta, it's it's good. I mean, it's it goes through the entire all these different steps. Uh, if you want to know how to develop these different sections, like threat analysis, attack modeling, it may some of the things may be a little bit out of date, but it's it's a decent starting point. It's worth just looking at. And Stride was developed by Microsoft in the 1990s. It's a little bit dated. Uh, it's not as current as something like MITRE ATT&CK, but it's it's interesting. I mean, it's it's a good it's another source of information, a good reference. I wouldn't rely on it completely, but it's a good reference. Dread was developed as a supplement to Stride, so they ask these questions for each potential threat. It's I mean, it's something again. If you're starting, it's good to get a wide range of sources and and so I, I would recommend just looking at it but i really like miter attack uh it's globally accessible it's like a wiki format it's graphical if you're a visual person it's an excellent tool for understanding the different stages and what i like is they go from reconnaissance to exfiltration to impact and all they have all the techniques and sub techniques and the nice thing is you can click on the techniques and you can even divide, subdivide it into different cloud platforms. Like if your company uses AWS, they'll have a whole wiki and a whole resource on, on how you can apply a MITRE attack to AWS or to Azure. Uh, I don't know if they have one for Google Cloud. I haven't seen it, but, but they may have it. But it, it's very good. And they have a whole guide to getting started. So I, I highly recommend MITRE attack. So my recommendations, many frameworks exist. There are a lot of similarities between all of them, but I think it's a good, to get a good overall view, it's uh, better to look at it at a, when you're starting a mile wide and a foot deep, and then you start to customize it based on your specific risk profile for the company you're consulting with or wherever you work. So that's why I think it's, a, it's, a, it's good to have exposure to all these different methodologies. So I like Octave personally because it's a good resource and they start at an enterprise level. They have an organizational emphasis. Uh, so, and it's a good place to develop some of the surveys, which can be sent to individuals for completion. So also use Octave guidelines for the group sessions too. They have, they have some good tools for that. Uh, understand, obtain an understanding of business risks and fraud risks. So you can look in the annual report you can talk to the internal audit team. You can see if there are any issues that they've identified that are recurring. That's something that's very important. 
and you shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. So these insights should flow into your adversary model. So remember, threat modeling, again, is adversary driven. So the NIST threat modeling framework is a great starting point because I really like the fact that they go through an entire example. So in the final stage, the overall model should include overall risk ratings and specific countermeasures. So you want to measure, create a heat map, red, yellow, green, and see where your highest risks are. Uh, and this constantly changes. You'll, you'll have to revisit this and, and based on changes within your organization, you want to revisit it. You may re-rate the risks and, and change the ratings and then you'll change your threat model. But always remember that your threat model should be a living document and should be revisited and edited on a frequent basis to accommodate changes, as I said. So just like anything else, I mean, changes always happen. Like uh, if, if any of you play blackjack, if you know how to count cards, what's the whole motivation behind counting cards? You, you count so that you understand what bets to make based on what the dealer gives everybody. You, what he's giving everybody so you you want to uh, based on that so it changes all that the count changes all the time and it tells you how to bet how to prioritize so the same way with with uh, threat modeling threats change risks change so you want to be able to change with that and accommodate those changes uh, always remember know thyself known know thine enemies and thine friends and that'll help you to know it all uh, one more thing I want to say, I know I talked about war elephants and in creating this presentation, no elephants were harmed. Thank you. Thanks a million, Kumar. I, I uh, think uh, after Kumar, we have uh, um, Slava. So Slava, if you can uh, please unmute and take over. Uh, so, I guess, thanks, Kumar, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, that's perfect. So, uh, in a sense, Kumar has been talking about a lot of stuff from what I wanted to talk about. Uh, so, I want this to give a bit more practical approach as to what do we do with uh, our clients? What do we do? What, what things are we looking for from our, uh, from how do we suggest our clients to protect their infrastructure? Uh, Mike will be talking after me uh, about the uh, due diligence, about due, due effort, about uh, different types of frameworks. So this, this part of the session will be probably a bit more simplistic, but with a practical twist. Um, so hopefully it's going to be useful as well. And it's going to essentially we're going to talk about who do we want to protect against. So uh, we all know that Okay, they are hackers. There are bad guys uh, that do come into our environments that uh, try to harm us. That so, who they who those guys are, and well, essentially, if we're talking about governments, if we're talking about the insurance companies, if we're talking about applying uh, different regulations. Any activity which uh, you would classify as uh, as any harm done to your enterprise, to your organization, to your company, to your systems, uh, should be treat, uh, treated as the cyber crime. And I mean, there is a wide set, quite a few definitions out, out there, uh, but it is always uh, something uh, activity uh, which is which has not been authorized, which which has not been approved, and it was either done with a computer system or to a computer system or through a computer system. 
and that's uh, almost always for profit. Sometimes it can be for political reasons and even less cases are personal. Like uh, an ex excellent employee will hold a grudge about the, uh, at, at the company. Uh, so whenever we are trying to understand how to build our defenses, uh, as Kumar was saying, we need to understand why we are protecting, what we are protecting, and who or what we are protect protecting against. So from our experience with our with many different cl different clients, we see that majority of attacks they are just coming out well for financial profit for for financial gain um and those attacks are usually done not even by specialized groups of hackers uh these days it can be done by pretty much anyone with an access to uh, even some of the freeware tools available with the Kali Linux, for example, Metasploit. Uh, tools can be easily purchased on the internet, on the darknet. Uh, there are multiple vulnerabilities uh, available and multiple exploits available for those vulnerabilities. So these days, when we're saying that we are protecting against, against hackers, it means that we are protecting pretty much against anyone. Uh, with, the, with access to those tools, it's just like random, in, in most cases, it's just a random chance that you or your organization will get hit. And uh, over the recent years, uh, there, there is a new term which has been coined and it is quite adopted these days. And, uh, well, we are calling this spraying bullets when people will be just launching big number of tar non-targeted or non-specifically targeted attacks, uh, just hoping to make, to, to score, to gain access to one of the systems. Especially we always see an influx of those types of attacks after some new zero day uh, exploit has been published. Even this year, when we had uh, a number of uh, vulnerabilities announced for Exchange servers, Microsoft Exchange servers, for Solar Winds, uh, they were public. They were known. The vendors released patches which fixed the issues, uh, but still there were quite a lot of systems available which were unpatched and those spraying bullets essentially they were successful in many cases just because the organizations behind those servers didn't pay enough attention to the patching to the uh security policies they 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 have uh to the systems they, they they're having so first key practical thing of what we see uh is happening on the on the hacking scene right now and and it we as a company and mike personally uh has some connections uh with hacking scene we've had some employees who were hackers so Mike can talk a bit more about this if he wants to, but essentially they're all confirming that in most cases, it is not the people who will write the exploit uh, will perform the attack. So the people who write the exploits, they will try to sell them, they will try to get their buck, but they, th they believe they are pretty safe with the with the fact that they are not using it. Okay, they might give give access to the tooling, but they're not using the tool themselves. So technically they are not breaking any 
any laws, any regulations. So more than 80% of all attacks which are happening with uh, our customers right now, with our clients, are just the results of those pretty stupid uh, initial scanning attacks. I mean, at, once the initial point has been breached, once the hacker got access into the environment, the the attacks can be can become quite complicated. Uh, the recon, recon, recon part can take a lot of time. The uh, the tooling can become quite advanced, but this first step uh, is bringing the malicious payload into the organization. This is where uh, most of the things, uh, most of the attacks, uh, well, they are just happening using the tools which are, as I mentioned, publicly available or easily accessible. Um, so when you are building your defense, uh, there will be just few things you need to make sure that they are happening. All of them uh, are very simple and people, I'm, I'm betting everyone knows about this, but for some reason, even experienced uh, admins, experienced, experienced uh, security, uh, engineers, CSS, so, so very, all in all, a lot of people will just tend to forget about some of the systems, some of the environments, some of the configurations, and this is where this, those, this is why those spraying bullet attacks are this effective. Uh, of course, like targeted attacks can be possible. Uh, they have a lot more chances to be successful, but the amount of resources spent of them uh, is usually so big that the average company, the average Joe, will never have to worry about them. Uh, just making sure that all the due care has been done in order to like pr make all the reasonable effort to prevent this from happening, to be able to file a insurance claim in order to be able to file a, uh, a form to a police so that the formal investigation can be started or to any other agency like in U.S. case, it's can be, it can be, let's say FBI. Um, so, uh, as Kumar was saying previously, and I will be repeating this as well: know your environment, control your environment, uh, ex exercise due effort. Uh, exercise reasonable protection, just understand what's happening, uh, understand what kind of attacks are you going to be preventing or protecting your environment from. And well, for the most part, you will be set. Um, there are very very old tools and tricks. There's uh, like all those uh, viruses which are like decades old. There are more recent malware, even more recent ransomware. There are multiple types of DDoS attacks. So not just networking overflow, but configuration overloads. Uh, so the, the many of the things uh, which will be happening, which uh, hackers will or will try or attempt to or to to deliver to your environment uh, in order to 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 get to that point. But once you get the re rather regular uh, 
Stava, are you still connected? Sorry. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so once you get the basic endpoint protection, basic firewalls, then you're gonna be uh, pretty secure. You can say that that you have performed your due uh, reasonable effort to stay secure. What is more interesting is what's uh, is more recent developments uh, with the APTs, advanced pers persistent threats, and fileless uh, malware uh, ransomware, which can also be LOL bins. So um, those are the systems. Th those are the the threats. We against which you have to go and essentially you can use any of the frameworks uh, Kumar was talking about. You can use Mitre, you can use Octave. Uh, there is one other framework which is uh, which I like, which Kumar didn't mention. It is from Lockheed uh, and it is called. Uh, Cyber kill chain, uh, which is essentially the, the, the same the same thing. Uh, the the framework which tries to emulate steps which an attacker will take to get into your environment, and will just guide you through the steps and processes uh, how to set up your protection against them, but. Here are the big concerns which are arising from those things. Uh, so everybody knows that one of the standard ways to protect against ransomware is to make backups, right? And it is something that we always recommend as well for our clients. Make sure that you have your backups configured, you make sure that they, they have been tested, that you know how to restore the, your systems, your data. Doesn't really matter if it is uh, snaps, snapshots of virtual image, uh, of virtual machines or some other form of backup. But uh, in many cases, uh, those APTs can stay in your systems undetected for quite a long period of time. We had a customer who came to us with the re request to help, to help him to analyze where his systems are getting hacked all the time. So he had like not one, not two, but at least 10 like attacks which were kind of similar, which included access to their backend databases, etc., uh, etc. Et and uh, well, when we analyzed their systems, we found some traces to to the back doors, to the uh, to the rootkits, which were introduced into their environment, well, I would say a year or even like a couple of years before uh, the, the hacks started to, ha started to happen. So the attackers had plenty of time to completely understand the environment of the customer, come figure out the weak points, figure out uh the databases figure out the passwords figure out the applications uh custom developed applications uh they were they were able to get the source code of those applications and study them and in in this case i mean well first of all it not every company is even able to afford to keep a year of uh snapshots daily let's say and even then, how much time it will take you to uh, first identify the source and then roll back day after day after day uh, to make sure that that source is no longer there and that uh, 
you still have to double check and triple check and pre check and pre check everything to make sure that there is nothing else there. So, and with fileless, it's becoming even worse when the oil beans is well, if someone is not really familiar with this, it is the tactics which allows to use standard files. Uh, a lot in many cases, files which are well, like DLLs, libraries, or executable files. In many cases, um, files which are already present in the in the in the operating systems, Windows-based or Linux-based, uh, well, for example, from Windows, every Windows will have cmd.exe, uh, so the standard command prompt. Well, it can be used for to LOL being being a type of attack, where uh, attacker might be, might can use this. Uh, Command uh, prompt just to write some data into, let's say, alternate alter, alternate NTFS data stream, or well, or even like Event Viewer app. Event Viewer app can be used to bypass user access control uh, mechanism in, imposed by Windows, starting from Windows Vista to to, to re the recent ones, Windows stands and uh, Windows servers 2019. And I mean, that's the, the standard part of the application, the, I mean, the standard part of the operating system, uh, which you essentially cannot remove. Uh, in Linux world, there are many cases when uh, you can use grab, you can use cat so very basic very standard um, systems uh, very standard applications which are being used to deliver uh, different kinds of uh, malicious sometimes it is malicious payload sometimes it is to be able to escape uh, user space sometimes it is to be able to bypass bypass built-in system uh, validations. Um, so when I'm saying that 80% of the attacks would be happening with the standard tools which are available, once the hacker will get into your environment, well, they can start deploying quite advanced things. Uh, in the worst case I've seen, the hacker, the company had their environments, uh, they had their environment separated on the networking level. Uh, so they had the hackers, they got, uh, that they, they were able to get control of the WordPress machine. And then they just, uh, build their way through several perimeter defenses and essentially they were able to cover the entire network and uh, they were able to map it out uh, luckily enough uh, no big damage was done except that uh, initial wordpress machine uh, they those attackers were caught but this gives us the second very uh, simple, very basic uh, advice. Do not rely on your existing infrastructure. Uh, the, for the advanced persistence threat, the biggest challenge for an attacker would be to over to, to, to map out, to recon through your network, to recon through your environment. And any change within your, that environment, uh, you can change, you can update Windows to a newer version, for example. You can replace your firewalls. You can uh, change the network access rules. So any change which happens within your env environment can, 
just throw the attackers off their weight and give you some additional time to 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 identify them to identify their activities and uh, yeah as i said sometimes it is tricky to to find this with the especially with fileless low lol bins but there are ways how this can be done as well uh we already discussed that the biggest part of hacking happens for financial profit and uh, in most of the cases we're seeing for the past few years the 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 target was pretty simple the attackers tried to drop in the some part of malware it could have been imitat it could have been anything else uh which was just used as a means to further download the malicious payload uh usually just with a simple powershell uh, just download the the code snippet with into the memory and then execute it out of the memory which again makes it another uh type of fileless software but they will spend very briefly trying very very small amount of time trying to understand uh the systems they will just do that to map out your environment to see if they can steal some data before they are get, getting detected if uh, yeah you're running out of time like speed up uh yeah okay so uh speeding up uh the case I'm referring to, the hackers, actually several very similar cases. Hackers get into the environment, try to snoop them through the network, try to see if they can extract the data. They were not able to. Uh, in one of the cases, the data was uh, stopped because of the unusually high network traffic, which was detected, and, and then the, like, the actions were taken. But then, uh, the ransomware encryption happened, and that's pretty much it. There was a ransom note, and uh, people just were trying to get the their money. Uh, so, how to fight the bad guys? Kumar was gave a great speech. So, you need to understand. You need to give reasonable level of protection. To do that, you need to understand who you are protecting against. Whom do you protect with? So you have to understand who your colleagues are, what is their level of knowledge, how to raise their awareness. Uh, understand your environment, pick applicable standard and follow it. Uh, when we implement the cybersecurity defense, we always recommend our customers to start with the risk assessment. Not all the data needs to be protected. And uh, in many cases, protecting too much data will just give you more problems than, uh, than benefits. When we know what do we need to protect, we can define when exactly it has to be protected, how it can be protected. Uh, we are, uh, sometimes we do recommend for our customers to create snapshots, but we definitely do not recommend to make snapshots, for example, for end, uh, end user PCs or laptops. We do suggest to be to take an app approach which would allow systems to be rebuilt from scratch rather than being restored from the backup. It is simpler, it is a lot, uh, it is usually saving a lot more time than just to start um, digging through the previous system trying to figure out if there is still some traces of malware, if there is any traces of APTs present in the system. Standard recommendations is to segment network traffic into smaller pool pools to be able to better control visibility, to be able to better control traffic flow, separate your critical systems into individual pools and always ship meaningful logs to central locations. 
you don't need to keep all the logs within your organization, but you have to understand what the, the meaningful will mean for you. For some people, it's going to be so, uh, accessing, modifying files. For organizations, for financial organizations driven for, by PCI DSS, that's going to be uh, logs of networking traffic, uh, and all the activities which are happening around CD, CDH. Uh, so, meaningful would mean different things in, in everyone's case, but uh, usually it is just basic user activities. Who has, who run which application, access which files, uh, and then just follow your policies, procedures, start, start re reviewing that and uh, um, yeah, just be on top of the things which are happening within the organization. Uh, right now, cybersecurity is an arms race. There are commercial actors, there are private actors, there are government actors, and uh, there are many types of protections. And well, you're uh, five minutes over. Okay, good. So. Final word, uh, there have been research done by IBM, which showed that having more tools is giving uh, less benefit and less security than having less tools, but uh, with people who know how they operate and how they're set up. So just know your environment, know your tools, don't run to have as many tools as possible, but try to make sure that you, you, that you can utilize uh, to the best the, the tooling, the instruments you have at your disposal. Uh, so with that, I will be done. Okay. I guess so. Thank you. you five so minutes. Stuff. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just announce the five minutes uh, coffee break, guys, because I think... Uh, we all need to refresh before an exciting talk about uh, that modeling with uh, Michael. So uh, please go ahead and start the five minutes break. We will okay. be back uh, 2011.
so while we're at the last minute of the um, coffee break, a small poll for uh, our audience. If you can choose, like, who do you think is bigger cybersecurity enforcer in the US? Is it NIST, FDIC, FTC, the Congress in uh, basically of the USA and the local courts, or uh, SEC? Can you please submit your um, choices? Uh, I see that uh, uh, quiz is going on. Yep, but uh, please take over the screen sharing, uh, and once uh, you you take over, we can start. Yeah. But the results are very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, we, we also have another quick poll. In the case of a breach, what is the first action? Preserve artifacts, eradicate the intruder, read policies and procedures, understand the motive. Do you guys see my screen? Yes, we do. Um, I see a, a comic of uh, Einstein. Uh, okay, so we're ready to start. And give it another uh, couple of seconds because there is another uh, poll, and then yeah, we uh, we can start afterwards. So um, yeah, interesting responses. Uh, I would say yeah. go ahead, uh, Michael. And thank you let so me, much for the day. Yeah, uh, sorry. Let me be very fast because uh, the problem is that the course that that uh, I'm running is three hours, and I got less than an hour so i'll try to squeeze things in and um, uh, i will be jumping uh through slides you will have full presentation so you will be able to uh see all the details uh but i will i will have to do it like very quickly now let's look at the at the chat at the i will be constantly looking at the chat so if you throw a question or opinion please uh you know, feel free. So, who there is a there is a uh, poll. Who do you think is the bigger cybersecurity uh, enforcer in the U.S.? Um, and people say NIST. NIST is an Institute of Standards. It's like ISO. They don't enforce anything. And it's very interesting because I thought you guys listened to Keith. And uh, in in the U.S., biggest reinforcer is FTC. Uh, FTC is Federal Trade Commission, as in the United States, there is no specific cybersecurity law. Uh, Federal Trade Commission takes um, uh, st regular consumer protection law that they have, and they argue if you are breached and you uh, you lose your customer's information, you endanger a customer, and they they are using uh, these laws to enforce. The next one. Uh, Paul, in the case of breach, what do you do in the case of the breach? And people say preserve artifacts. And my personal opinion, I would argue that you have to go to your policies and procedures. We'll talk about it, but depending on where you, where you are and where your customers are, you're on the clock to report it to law enforcement agencies. And sometimes it's more important to a report to the agencies, uh, a report to attorney general, or a file a police report, it's more important than to uh, preserve evidences, so you're just gonna get less penalties. Or, and, 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 and your actions, you have to split uh, your team. One should be messaging to, to the outside world, uh, get approval from executives, what to say, how to say, who to talk to, and uh, another team should be concentrated on actual, uh, uh, you know, figuring out the bridge and eradicating people and do all 
these things that uh, they they have to do on the on the, on the technology side. So, guys, I would really suggest to develop the uh, uh, develop develop the uh, cybersecurity response team policies and procedures uh, because under the pressure you will be uh shaking and uh and you will be running on the on 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 on, on a clock to do certain things so it has to be developed and prepared uh your, so your biggest enforcement in private private sector it would expect enforcement to be stronger in the public sector like me other now when we say enforcement is uh who will be punishing you so like cops will come to you and sue you i mean arrest you sue you whatever so ftc is creating uh more uh i guess it's uh it's a terminology so yeah in the united states like law uh, who whomever is bigger enforcer is whomever will be punishing you and suing you for uh cyber security breaches so maybe it's a misunderstanding in the in the terminology. Uh, what is harder to implement? It's uh, yeah, it's uh, PCIC NIST. Yeah, uh, this is just for me to to to, to gauge the, the 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 audience. So uh, let's let's talk about the presentation. So why standards? Uh, even one Einstein would not be able to put things together. Uh, all the standards are joint opinion of uh, a bunch of people and uh, when when you try to uh, figure figure something out uh, on your own you will forget something i have a great example one CISO of a large financial company showed me his plan i looked at it and i said listen this is uh you know 80 percent of nist core why don't you take nist core and he worked on it for like i don't know two three months and i said like take nist core just implement it and forget about it uh, so, uh, standards are, you know, the basic recommendation, there are many of them, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about it uh, a lot. Uh, so, a standard is anything written, written, but it's hard to say if PCI is a standard, because it's basically a bunch of banks got together and said, okay, this is what we want to see from you uh, if you want to get uh, cheaper deals. Uh, high trust is kind of like methodology because controls are more like ISO. Um, uh, Cloud Security Alliance, another organization, I wouldn't call them standard, but they have their own opinion on uh, um, on things. ISO is certainly a standard because they even call, you know, international standard organization. NIST certainly it's U.S. standard, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Institute of Standards. Uh, for and technology, uh, SSAET, it's a weird thing too because it's not it's not it's not a standard in my opinion. But people can it, it doesn't it doesn't mean that they are bad or <coughs> someone from some some standard from uh, some of those frameworks from the technology standpoint uh, better or worse. I mean they they they're all good. So this is a, a slide. You will get those slides. This is a comparison of a, a few of them. I'll run quickly to, to, to save time. So ISO, I think like everybody, <coughs> everybody here know ISO because it's more international, more kind of European. I see that people say that it's 12% uh, uh, of people saying that ISO is hard to implement, uh, but uh, it means that most of people in here uh, think that it's easy to implement. So um, uh, it's international, it's certifiable. Being certifiable is very important because uh, third party would say, yeah, uh, uh you know certain controls we checked and we uh you know agree that uh, the organization follows the standard it's widely widely recognized and accepted the uh disadvantages of the standard is uh, that it's very procedural i will explain what i mean when when i'll speak about SOC. uh, uh another disadvantage that is top down meaning that the whole organization should sign up. You cannot implement it on the IT, on the department level. So there are certain controls like executive meetings and, you know, uh, um, internal reviews. They all kind of organization-wide. Uh, NIST 
east uh the pros are it's uh american national i mean for for us it's good because some laws and future laws most likely will be written with influence on on uh, by new standards some lawmakers are asking to write uh, write a standard and then make it a law so it's very kind of uh, government sponsored and government uh, centric uh, organization and uh, needs can be adopted at any level the disadvantage the cons of the uh, standard is that it's not certifiable PCI very active standard very good standard uh, we like it uh, it is certifiable uh, very usually the qualified assessors are very um, knowledgeable people and they they are squeezing uh, lots of uh, information before they certify cons are uh, it's more people perceive it as a e-commerce specific uh, I disagree with it because it's a good platform, but people say, why would I do it? I don't process uh, credit cards. It's not really recognized in manufacturing or financial wor world, but it's okay. So SSE 18 SOC 2, I hope Keith was talking about it. When uh, US government created laws that financial records have to be audited and preserved, they realize that there is a need for IT to support those financial records. And um, uh, AICPA organization created this kind of methodology of auditing company. So it's not a standard, it's basically report how things are done. The pros of this uh, report is that it's not procedural as ISO. And let me give you an example and comparison. I'm pretty sure you know about it. So let's say you have backups. And if in, in the ISO world, the auditor will check, uh, will say, okay, show me the backup. And uh, you will show that all backups are in there. Some of them failed. You, you remediate. He will be totally okay with this. What's inside of those backups? He wouldn't care. In the uh, SOC 2 world, in SSA 18 world, the auditor wanted to make sure that you are backing up things that we will help a company to survive. And it's very big difference. They are not so much in enforcing like all controls and digging, but they wanted to make sure that whatever you do is not just you do it, but it's meaningful in terms of business uh, surviving uh, cyber attack or disaster or whatever it is that, that, that financial records or even service that you deliver to your client will be intact no matter what. Uh, cons uh, are, uh, it's, it's a loose report. There is no like even standard how to do it. And we saw that uh, sometimes reports are very shallow. Sometimes uh, our client is asking their vendor, uh, do you have a SAC report? And they, yes, we do. We do have SAC report. They send the SAC report, and you read. And our client wants to acquire one service. The vendor provides five services, and SAC report is written only on one service, and that is not related to the service that our client is trying to acquire. So SAC report could be like anything. You really need to read it, and uh, you really need to understand what uh, this report is written for. High trust, very tough. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any uh, experience with it. Uh, the most expensive, uh, the most expensive from the financial standpoint. Uh, they have very strong methodology how to probe and verify controls, uh, and. Uh, uh, hard to pass through. The biggest hurdle is that they have, so in ISO, when auditor take a look at your controls and he's like, ah, okay, it's good. It's, it's, it's okay. So it's basically yes or no. In high trust, the controls are divided in domains and they scoring each control and then they uh, have methodology how to score the whole domain. And in the end, and Different auditors are scoring different different controls, and you are not getting 100% on all of them, but you have to end up 
uh, with I don't remember it's like 75 points or uh, there is a there is a point and we will be able to sa send you if anyone is interested we will be able to send the charts how they are measuring uh, high trust uh, uh, where's the methodology to manage the control maturity because they go by by, by maturity and it could be I don't know the auditor could say it's 64 percent on another one they will say 92 and then when they calculate you get the number and if this number is below a certain number that's it you 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 done you you can have a report but not uh, uh, yeah, I see that people are interested in high trust. We'll send it to your chapter. Uh, we'll send the methodology. We have graphs for it. And uh, let me see if I could show it to you very quickly. Uh, now let me. No, I'll, I'll, I'll email it to you. There are there are charts that uh, uh, they use. Um, so the whole theme of this presentation, and we wanted to say only two things and everything else will be supporting um, uh, supporting these two points. This is point number one. Laws and regulations do not expect that all information security will be prevented. So nobody is looking at us that we have to defend our client or uh, you know our business. Uh, there could be breaches or uh, attacks or ransomware attacks. We Nobody is looking for us to uh, be 100% pr protective. And standards, if you take a standard, anything, high trust, NIST, whatever it is, you implement, they will not guarantee that, that, that these clients will be protected. But laws and regulators uh, require us to implement reasonable safeguards to prevent harm, prevent our clients from harm. And this is essence of duty to care. So we must assess what is what is reasonable and implement those reasonable reasonable safeguards. And judges and courts they are measuring this duty duty to care uh, responsibility to determine liability uh, liability of organizations in data breaches. Um, so. FTC is basically saying that risk assessment is the methodology that company used to demonstrate that uh, they understand what is reasonable and what controls to implement. And same thing with, with GP, GDPR. So message number one is very important that laws and regulations requiring us to implement reasonable safeguards. This word reasonable is very uh fuzzy and what i suggest is to implement a standard because if standard is fully implemented and certified or not certified but no judge will say that it was not reasonable because it's widely recognizable if you do something whatever whatever you think is right it will be hard for you to prove that that it is reasonable uh, but but if you implement the standard, you could you, you will you will have a case. The second uh, point that I wanted to make in this presentation is that all the standards basically the same, and I will show you how we do things. And when we uh, implement technology uh, based on the on our I don't know, uh, let's say approach. You could you could you could comply with with, with anything, and uh, you guys can challenge me later. Uh, throw messages in the uh, in in the chat. You could you could challenge, but I so far our latest audit was uh, Department of Homeland Security. One of our um, client that is international logistic company was audited by customs. And Depart Department of Homeland Security checked their uh, cybersecurity posture, and they totally said that we we in a good shape. Uh, I have a question, but reasonable uh, reasonable in uh, American way or looking to do, isn't it? <laughs> Again, uh, what what I'm saying, I I don't really like understand understand the question, but uh, again. Uh, you're in front of the judge and you have to prove that you did reasonable things. So try to prove it. And it's very, 
there's um, um, ambiguity in in the in this uh, term. So it's up to you to prove that that you did reasonable things. And what I'm saying is, rather than thinking how to prove it, implement the standard in the beginning. Uh, you say, hey, listen, I implemented the standard. What else do you want? Did you want me to do? So uh, this is like my first point. Uh, the second point uh, that they are all the same. They use a different paradigm. Okay, yeah, could be. Uh, in Europe, you guys probably use something different. But again, we are talking about SMB space in the United States. Um, so uh, I saw these are slides for ISO structure, and I'm pretty sure you know it. These slides are for NIST structure, SSAE structure. Um, I just wanted to tell you that recently, uh, I'm not sure if you guys know about it. I saw added uh, additional standard to 27001 called 27701. Uh, it would be good if you guys text me who, who is familiar with this standard. Uh, and SSAE 18 SOC 2, they also have standard criteria, but recently they added additional, additional criteria for privacy. And they treat it as uh, not uh, separately certifiable, but uh, kind of in addition to, 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 the main, to the main framework, to the main standard. And if you want it to be certified on that specific thing, uh, on, on the privacy, it usually costs you half of the certification. So if, let's say, uh, ISO cost you $30,000, they would be looking for additional $15,000 to uh, give you uh, also certify you on 27701. So guys, if you could, if you could throw in a chat meeting, if you, if you had an experience with uh, uh, privacy additions to any of the standards, would be interesting. Um, zero trust. I will. Uh, so there are materials. I would really suggest you to uh, watch this guy. Uh, he is very funny, and he's really, uh, you know, uh, he knows what he's talking about. Everybody's talking about uh, zero trust, and it's all about access management. And I will just show you very quickly example uh, how we handle that uh, zero trust thing. Uh, so before we had everybody was working in the offices, uh, people came up with the concept of Active Directory, uh, passwords, access, control, everybody is uh, nicely encapsulated in physical offices. Then we start introducing data centers, some applications went to data centers, so uh, Active Directory or Access Database was uh, synchronized between like applications in Active Directory and in uh, on-premises. Uh, then what we started seeing, and it's kind of very interesting, um, very interesting companies started popping up where they don't have office, they don't have basically like anything. And uh, they develop something using GitHub and throw code in AWS. They use Slack to communicate, G Suite for email, Salesforce for for sales, and there is no offices. They like totally distributed it. So, um, uh, the uh, it's very hard to even and and these companies when there are ten ten people, it's okay, but when you know, they start growing 20, 30, 40. And I ask them, how do you know how to onboard person? And they're like, oh, this manager figure out how to create account. How do you figure out how to terminate uh, uh, terminate uh, uh, an employee? And they're like, oh, well, we are going, we're checking. So it's very hard. So it has to be some kind of like uniting uh, directory service. And when we, we kind of get used to, we, we, we inside of Microsoft environment perimeters, let's throw Active Directory and that's it. And when you have these distributed uh, type of uh, work, uh, you need some kind of a directory service that uh, helps 
to figure out who belongs to what and what access and different applications they have. And we had uh, latest implementation we were basically analyzing and you will see what we were analyzing and features and whatever, we basically selected one of the vendors. As I said, I don't want to, I didn't want to throw any vendor names here, not specifically for the advertisement, but just to uh, uh, be neutral, but in this case we uh, selected uh, Jump Cloud. You'll 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 you you will take a look, and uh, uh, it allows us to have single directory when you onboard someone. It basically would create automatically access in all the application that 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 is registered with Jump Cloud. When you terminate someone, you uh, you say this guy block access and it would automatically go to all the vendor and cloud providers and terminate terminate access. Uh, it's easy to audit, it's easy to integrate to your uh, different uh, uh, compliance solutions. So this is uh, zero trust implementation. Um, uh, also, if you guys interested, uh, does is uh, the question is that would be let me let me read through the uh, chat quickly <sighs> this would apply to all common law systems mm -hmm. English law. yeah yeah I I, I agree with uh, Slava does yes please see also Slava. yes Domis as a service. Ah, yeah. Jump Cloud does is the yes. Uh, Jump Cloud. Um, I don't remember the URL, but we, we, we you, the, you'll be able to see it. Yeah, the, the URL from Isaac is actually a previous uh, webinar, uh, Michael, about uh, zero trust uh, from mm -hmm. readiness and fitness from strategy to operations, which deep dived into uh, zero trust quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to, to DAS, yeah, it does director as a service. Essentially, it is a central part of Zero Trust to be able to provide the identity to AD system applications. So, yeah, Gem Cloud is an example of DAS vendor. Yeah, uh, we have a slide that is additional. Uh, there is no slide. I cannot kind of share it with you. And if anyone is interested in the architecture, but uh, I can I can share. I will have to mask certain information, but AWS allows or any public cloud. I'm not saying AWS specifically allows us to rethink how we do things and really segment uh, applications using that tooling. So you could say, okay, we're running all the messaging. Put them put them in one in one segment. Do it not like like a DMZ, but totally dedicated uh, segment then you put you all the users in one segment then your database your application you could create segment uh, for each application that you use so it will allow to minimize lateral movement because if let's say you publish uh, your all all your files let's say sitting somewhere on nas you only allow uh, only allow file sharing protocol. Uh, you could configure it so there is only one port. So if someone get as a user to your environment, to your let's say VDI environment, they cannot have full highway to the server that host the documents, to the servers that host uh, your messaging, your email, or your chat uh, information. Uh, or to your databases, only certain ports are open. So uh, any public cloud allows us to break it down and create uh, a segment for each individual service or application and separate users. So like when you, when, if uh, a bad guy get to one segment, it's very hard for him to get to, to another block or he would have to figure out how to get it there. So it like slows down the movement. So why I'm, 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 I'm talking about it uh, during zero trust because it's kind of what it is. You basically segment and you allow specific access to specific segments using using different rules and different different rule sets. So there is no uh, easy way 
if you get in into like one perimeter, you should consider that it should be like multiple perimeters, not like one single wall around the fortress, but also walls inside of this fortress. Um, okay, now I'm going to talk about the second point that all cybersecurity standards are kind of the same and show you our vision on how we do things. So. No matter what we do, no matter what standards you take, it's all about kind of like two things. Uh, it's all about the information that we protect and the risks and how we mitigate those risks uh, uh, for this information. So we need to understand what we're protecting and we, we need to assess what we do to protect it. And certainly we have our context and scope so to understand uh, from where to where uh, what, are, what are the limits of our cybersecurity system? So information classification is very important. I'm not going to go deep. I'm, I'm pretty sure that you know the standard is FIPS. Uh, actually, I don't know because we are not in the United States. It's a very uh, um, uh, famous, not, not, not a famous, but kind of known, known standard in the United States. It basically suggests it's, it's a longer document, but you could minimize everything in this table and you could read it i'm not going to read it for you uh, so each information should be classified and they should and, and and it should be assessed from the cia factor and its confidentiality integrity and availability i'm not going to be chewing long on it so it's basically confidentiality is uh, uh, you know, if someone can get that information and pull it out, integrity is, uh, if someone can modify the information availability, if someone could delete the information or there is no internet connection uh, or network connection, information is not available. And they classify it low, moderate, and high. And if all of them low and uh, one of the uh, factor is high, the whole confidentiality, the whole information is critical uh, and the second one is risks risks i wanted to talk a little bit more about it because it's i think it's very important and i'll try to bring relationship to uh mitre to threat uh, analysis in here uh you could you could read the slides but uh i'm pretty sure that you guys are familiar with risks in ISO world for example my big criticism of all the risks in uh, NIST today, in ISO, in PCI, in whatever, whatever, whatever it is. On one side, we have simplistic view of ISO. Uh, and ISO risk came from industrial risks. So you have some kind of like a piece of a machinery or you have a tank with uh, gasoline and uh, they assess the risk. What is the risk? And what is the mitigation factor? We put a valve and we can mitigate 90% of problems. We put a second valve and we can mitigate, uh, uh, there is a residual risk 10%. We could put a second valve um, on, on the system and it would mitigate uh, another 9%. And our total risk is 99%. And uh, my biggest argument with this is that it's not working in cybersecurity world. So you cannot take this industrial approach. I mean, you can, but but it's not going to be effective. Uh, now, uh, we are members of CIS, Center for Information Security, and they came up with uh, uh, risk assessment, uh, risk uh, assessment methodology, uh, CIS RAM version two, and it's much better view on the risk. I think I will record uh, my review of uh, uh, CSRAM and I have two points that they, they, they did very well. So one of them is they say that our risks are multidimensional. So it's not just, just one risk. Uh, for example, the tank will explode and some people could, could die. So in cybersecurity, they say that there are three types of risks and they call it mission, uh, objective, and obligation. Uh, 
I was calling it, uh, and 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 the system, the GRC system that we use is uh, calling it uh, financial risk, reputational risk, and uh, legal risk. Basically the same thing. When I when I said it to them, they said, "Oh, basically, mission is your uh, 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 reputational, and objective is your financial, and uh, obligation is your legal risk." I I agree with that. Now, my, my, my next criticism to them uh, is they use the same notion, uh, risk is, uh, let me see if I have it on, on, on the next slide. Yeah, so risk is basically like the likelihood impact and then they, they come up with a rating and they're trying to calculate this rating. And my problem with this is that in the cybersecurity world that, that, that we are now, it's not just a dynamic. It's dynamic in term. It's not just. It's a multi-dimensional. It's still dynamic. So you cannot say that. Oh, I mitigated uh, my risk for ninety percent or ninety-five percent or wh wh whatever the number is. And there are lots of people that are using Excel spreadsheets to calculate nice math, show it to 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 uh, you know execs. My problem with this is this. You. Uh, today, you say that we are mitigated. We put 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 an antivirus on uh, on the system, and we uh, let's say you you pull it from the thin air and say 99% is mitigated. Tomorrow it will be uh, zero day vulnerability, and the whole your mitigation will go to to zero basically. And uh, with different situations, there are so many things that affect your posture and your uh, risk. Uh, risk mitigation uh, scoring that I think it's all like there is, there is no way you can calculate it. There is, I don't know, uh, if you want, you could take a look at uh, FAIR uh, standard. It's uh, fairinstitute.org. They have some complicated, very complex way to assess risk and to uh, put some kind of number and financial value on it. And I argue against it as well because, okay, they put, uh, okay, this is the risk and we could lose $10 million. But how can you guarantee that it is that? Because what if uh, uh, ransomware guys will ask you for $20 million ransom or for $1 million ransom? So they, they they are pulling these numbers from like uh, I don't know from where from from thin thin air, but uh, risks are very important, and I can tell you what we are using risks for. Only two things that we are using risks for. Number one is a control selection, because if you don't have this risk, why would you implement the uh, why would you implement this risk? If uh, uh, or if you have this risk you figure out what controls have to play a role in mitigating these uh, risks. So how we do risk assessment, and I'm sorry, I'm jumping through the slides because I'm like squeezed uh, uh, a little bit. Yeah, so risk function is to select controls. Um, we <coughs> create create uh, uh, information classification and we say we have this information, this information, this information. And we say that uh, information A is public, information B is private, information C is private. I think, uh, Michael, you accidentally muted yourself. Yes, Mike, Mike, there is no voice. Uh, how about now? Yes, yeah. now we can hear. Thank uh, you so someone much. Someone muted me. Oh, I, I did it by accident. Yeah, so... Um, so again, you 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 say, okay, this is the the information, this is the classification, it has PII in it, and then we, we apply risks to it. So uh, one of the function is uh, uh, is to select controls. Another function, I said two. I, I broke it down a little bit. So uh, it's also for executive um, awareness. 
So like once a year, we show risks to executives and say, okay, here are the risks. What do you want to do, do with it? Uh, throw a little bit money in this risk or you just say forget about it we we're just gonna accept the risk or whatever so it, that that meeting is very very important must must happen once a year and to present present risks for executives and all the budgets all the driver of uh, of uh, the IT uh, challenges beside the functionality that that would help to deliver uh, services to to clients uh, has to be driven by uh, risk uh, risk assessment and report to to the executives. Uh, also, we uh, we will show you. Uh, I will show you if I have enough time. Uh, the idea is that we tied our risk management uh, uh, risk management. Um, Let's say Excel spreadsheet or whatever, whatever you call it. You you register risk somewhere. We record all incidents. And uh, for example, our antivirus showed that someone clicked on something and uh, it blocked the malware. So we would record that information. We would say that uh, it was mitigated 100%. Or it wasn't mitigated, or 50% was mitigated. So, like anything happens to the information, someone took a file, and our DLP system would uh, notice that the file that was sent uh, sent out had the uh, social security number or medical information in it. There is an incident, and uh, we ap apply incident to the risk. So we count how many incidents of each risk type we had, and that would change the likelihood. So every year we collect this information because we could statistically as FAIR Institute is saying, oh, statistically it's that. But in our, in our company, we are that size, that industry, hackers are not, uh, you know, don't care about us. And we basically accumulate that, that, that statistics and we say that uh, we hit these risks 20 times this year, and uh, the mitigation was 100%, then why would we care? Um, and, uh, or we say, okay, we hit, we hit this risk, uh, you know, 20 times and mitigation is zero, what are we doing with this? We, we need additional training, we need additional budget, this is where we have to concentrate next year. So this historical view is very important, and again, it, go, it goes together with the uh, executive, uh, uh, executive um, uh, awareness. Uh, we are measuring effectiveness, as, as I said, uh, we are measuring likelihood and we create that custom statistics that, that work for us. So risk uh, matrix is not really use, usable if you do it once. You really have to bring everything to that, to that risk management uh, uh, methodology so you uh, can show the effectiveness of your work to executives once a year. And once a year, you adjust controls because, uh, by the way, if there, is a, if there is an incident and the risk does not exist for this incident, you, uh, you basically create a risk. And then you have to readjust your controls and implement the controls. So this is like your, your life, your history. And once a year, you review it uh, during a risk, uh, risk analysis your risk, uh, risk review, yearly risk uh, review. Now, this is our view, and this is my second point, that all standards are the same, and this is how we implement them. And uh, you guys can challenge me and say, you know, it's all BS, and you know, you cannot do this. But this is how we do things. So first, we do basic setup. Basic setup is uh, governance. Who makes decision? We write it down. Like I'll show you how we're doing doing it, but uh, think of an Excel file and bunch of Word documents. Doesn't matter. You need to capture who makes decisions. What is the context of the the organization or the the scope of uh, what we are protecting? Uh, what what is the business? What are the services? So we put like some documentation describing describing the, the, the system. So we do use a GRC uh, government risk uh, compliance system, uh, but it could be done in, in an Excel file. Uh, the, uh, then we do information classification. 
uh, per FIPS standard. Uh, then we assess uh, risks, and I'll go into deeper details. I still have five minutes. Then we select controls, then we write policies and procedures, make sure that technology is implemented for the controls. We collect artifacts, we uh, organize security operation incident response, we do uh, our yearly review, audits, and then uh, we are ready for an internal audit for the certification. And then next year again, we are reviewing risks. As I said, we collected all the all the information of our, how we did it, how we lived during the year, uh, reanalyze, show it to executives, and we do the full cycle again, and we're ready for for the recertification. And I have a few messages. Let me look. I can argue that if accountability means non reputation, then it is not really a part of. CIA trade. Hmm. True. Mike, that, that's a discussion we've had in the chat, so it uh -huh. looks a bit uh, above, but it started with a question, what about uh, accountability, CIAA? So not just oh. CIA factor, but oh, okay. accountability into that. And uh, for me, well, and for me, accountability is still a part of integrity. So non-repudiation, you have to trust the data and you have to validate its source. So, by, by, the, by the way, I had a very funny uh, thing today I've heard. Uh, one guy said, yeah, we have shared model for security responsibility. So like, you know, like public cloud guys would say, okay, this is shared model. This is what we are responsible for. And this is what you are responsible for. So one lawyer had an argument that, uh, yeah, there is a shared responsibility model, but there is no shared liability model. It was never a case when uh, any of of a client of guys like Azure or AWS, uh, when it was a breach, they could put liability on the cloud. It's like so. Yeah, there is a there is a there is a shared responsibility, but no shared uh, shared liability. Let me go through all these steps quickly. Um, You'll be able to look what we are what we are capturing during each step. The only thing is that uh, when we do information classification with the red, I'm highlighting how we enrich the standards, and this is like our our view. So information classification, FIP suggests to to capture the CIA factor, but we also capture if uh, there is PII in this data uh, uh, in this. Uh, information classification because when you capture this information about PII, you're already uh, preparing yourself for uh, privacy frameworks. Uh, we also put information. We we also store informational assets. Uh, uh, like uh, you know, this is financial document, uh, financial information, and sits in QuickBooks. Then we have we also put retention policy. Uh, deletion rules, uh, access rules, like you will be able to see how we implement things and how we enrich existing standards with like kind of like our vision and uh, uh, you will see how we kind of do things and I'm kind of like running out of out of time uh, but I wanted to say a few things more and I'm, I'm, I'm closing. Uh, so when you when you go through all these cycles, you should be ready for for the fight. Um, a few things that I wanted to say. So vendor management. Uh, I don't know how about you, but in the U.S. we have lots of pressure. Our our clients are asking us uh, about our uh, cybersecurity posture, and we are asking our client uh, our vendors too. So we suggest that we should standardize, like when we implement it for other guys. And there is a movement that all these questionnaires should be standardized around some kind of like framework because people creating these questionnaires they like crazy. It's hard to answer them, and if they are based on the standard. People understand standards, and it's easy to, uh, you know, come up with a, a easy common common language. Uh, we also uh, uh, about education. We have to run educations, and there are controls in in my, uh, you know, that spiral. Uh, I just want to say that there is education for general employees, and we should run education for privileged users uh, because uh, they could do more harm. Uh, reviews and audits, you'll be able to read about uh, automatic artifacts and manual artifacts. Uh, very quickly, uh, 
when you deploy and when you are reviewing any like readiness for clouds and migration to clouds, we use uh, three uh, levels of granularity, code readiness, configuration readiness, and process readiness. So code, code, code verification. Uh, and we verify code, we verify configuration, we verify uh, uh, process. So for code configuration, we use OWASP standard. Uh, look through it, a uh, very good standard, uh, uh, very nice thing to know and teach programmers how to, how to use it. Uh, now, for configuration readiness, we use CIS benchmarks, and these benchmarks are also good for hardening. And I can tell you that we have, like, uh, we, we use uh, NASUS to basically provide all the information. And, for example, you basically hit um, uh, your Azure uh, account, your Azure subscription. It would run through the, through the controls and give you full uh, list of what was uh, uh, implemented and what was not implemented. And then you harden it, you take it as a baseline, and you can easily show to clients, uh, you know, what is, what is, you know, uh, what controls are implemented, what controls are not, not implemented uh, for subscription, for a server. So it's a really good framework for uh, benchmarking and hardening. Uh, there is a there is a link you can see that you know there are benchmarks not just for like Amazon but but for all different databases for Lambda for like whatever whatever is on the market today and for process readiness it's more like a larger uh, standards like ISO NIST whatever it is uh, how we hire people how we fire people and so on and so forth sorry I'm two minutes late. Uh, there are more materials, and in the end, you will be able to see that we have descriptions of breaches and analysis if Im Im implementation of uh, cybersecurity framework would be able to defend uh, uh, clients or not. And uh, there are mixed results, uh, questions, answers. I will share all the materials with the, with the organization. Uh, thank you, everybody, for having us, and sorry that I had to run because I was squeezed. No, no worries, Michael. Uh, one last question before we go. It seems like Jose um, Luis uh, Sanchez Mila, I, I saw in your slide collecting artifacts. Could you elaborate a bit on this step? I guess um, he's asking about like post mortem analytics, but, but uh, analysis, but. Uh, I'm not sure. No. So the idea is that yeah. when auditors are coming, they wanted to see artifacts that you actually ah, control with okay. the control. And our our position is that some controls are technical, some controls are manual. Technical controls are like backups, and you collect logs of backups, and you monitor them, and you react if there is an error, you collect them. So those are automatic, uh, automatic uh, uh, artifacts collection. But some things you have to do manually. You cannot, like, for example, uh, review of your Active Directory users or review of uh, firewall rules one, once a year. Those are very hard to organize because it has to be like scheduled, someone needs to be responsible, someone has to write, write a memo about it, and auditors usually take a memo, but you need a system to basically keep them in some kind of like organized fashion. This is what I wanted. Uh, Okay, I, I would like to thank you all, along with all our uh, previous speakers, uh, Slava and Kumar, for the great uh, event. And also remind everyone uh, that's still on the call that uh, our next uh, Square Table webinar is going to be June 2nd, 2021, uh, with the title of like Managing Business Value for IT. And the speaker will be Amir Jamil. With that, I would uh, uh, wish you all a great, great evening and hope to see you on the next webinar. Thank you so much for... Uh, uh, Mikhail Slava and uh, Kumar, and hope to uh, see you soon. Thanks, Emilia. Uh, 